Good afternoon, folks. My name is Tim Chapin. I'm the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Public Policy at Florida State University. Uh, welcome to season five of Policy Pub, um, uh, with a, one of the uh, best uh, running series, uh, either in person or online. Um, you'll notice this year we're continuing our online webinar, our webinar series. For those of you that are returning, you know how this works. Uh, for those of you that are new to the Policy Pub, uh, let me tell you a little bit about it. First of all, this is an attempt by the college and a successful attempt by the college to bring the research of our faculty, students, uh, and our alumni to the broader uh, Tallahassee community and actually the broader uh, or the wider community. Uh, we used to do these in person, uh, but you might have noticed there's this little thing called a pandemic the last oh, little while, we'll say, and we've moved to a virtual format and are doing a virtual policy pub. Uh, the Policy Pub was the inspiration of Associate Dean Dina Rollinger. You'll hear from her more later uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, and again, she said, uh, uh, Dean Chapin, let's bring our ideas to the people. Let's bring policy out into the world. And we've been doing this now for about five years. Um, the way this works is we'll have our uh, featured speaker that I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, we'll uh, give a talk of about 20 minutes um, and speak on their topic. Uh, after that, there's ample time for discussion, Q&A, um, and feedback from the community. Uh, our attendees have a variety of ways that they can chime in. Uh, when we get to the Q&A stage, you can actually post Q&A questions into the chat feature, or you can chime in, raise your hand, and actually ask a, a question during the, uh, the session. Uh, we're here for you to answer your questions and, and uh, get your ideas about the work that we're doing. Um, tonight's speaker is from our Emergency Management and Homeland Security Program. Uh, Director David Merrick is here to talk with us today about a lot of his work in the use of uh, drones uh, to advance public policy and safety, uh, respond to disasters. He's got some really exciting work that he's going to be talking about tonight. Um, we're very honored that Director Merrick is here to talk about this, but I know he's got a great team behind him as well. Um, uh, uh, we've got this wonderful um, uh, emergency management program. Lots of students are interested in uh, learning about the use of all sorts of tools, including drones, to respond to disasters, to help promote safety and security. Uh, Director America, I'm going to stop talking now and let you take it over from here. Thank you very much to those of you that are attending. Uh, Director America, thank you for taking your time tonight. Over to you. Thank you, Dean Chapin. I appreciate that very much. And I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their Tuesday evening. To... Yep, it's Tuesday. Sorry. Uh, taking time out of their evening and, uh, and joining us here. I'm going to throw a slide deck up on the screen. Um, and we do have uh, uh, closed captions going on here as well. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Dr. Rollinger is going to be handling questions and answers, but if you have any uh, anything throughout the presentation, feel free to put a hand up uh, and let us know, and we'll be sure we get those uh, those questions answered. Uh, so my name is Dave Merrick. I'm the director for the Center for Disaster Risk Policy and the Emergency Management and Homeland Security Program here at FSU. Um, we're going to talk tonight about what we're calling disaster intelligence and how we use a variety of technologies to improve decision making um, in a disaster. Uh, and um, you know, we're going to focus a little bit on two case studies uh, tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about our, uh, we spent about 24 days at Surfside at the uh, Champlain Towers collapse. Uh, and then we recently uh, went to Louisiana uh, to support uh, the state fire marshal there for Hurricane Ida. Um, those are two very different events, um, but they have a lot of similarities. And so we're going to try to bring it back together um, at the end here. Um, and, and kind of talk about, you know, what works and what doesn't. So our concept is of disaster intelligence, the overall goal of what we're trying to accomplish here um, is to increase what we call situational awareness. Every, every disaster is dynamic. There are parts of that disaster that change quickly. There are parts that change a little, you know, a little slower, but very little in there stays static, stays the same. So understanding what's happening in the event, um, what is likely to change again in the future. Those are critically important for decision makers and policy makers um, so that they can make good decisions, right? Um, as I tell my students, the, the, the first indicator that you are in a disaster is when you don't have enough of anything. Um, there's never enough resources, there's not enough personnel, um, there's never enough time. So 
in that resource constrained environment where you are um, struggling to get you know the most basic things done, good decisions can make the difference between a good response and recovery and a poor response and recovery. So, uh, so all of this concepts that we're going to talk about is really aimed at um, providing that information to decision makers. If you have good information, you probably can make good decisions. You can make good decisions. Doesn't mean that you will. Um, whereas the opposite is in an absence of information, it is extremely difficult to make good decisions. So uh, we're trying to, to close that gap. And this is something that, uh, that you know, we've been doing since we've, we've been managing emergencies, not necessarily just using drones. Uh, but this new technology is helping us do this faster um, and in a lot of ways, uh, in a more cost-effective way than we could before. So the first thing we're gonna, the first case we're gonna talk about is uh, the Champlain South tower collapse. Uh, this was in Surfside, Florida. You're all you're all aware. Um, an incredibly tragic event and uh, incredibly frustrating for for all of us that worked on the scene um, because there was a significant lack of progress. Right, um, uh, the collapse happened on on 24 June. Uh, it's on a Wednesday night, Thursday morning, uh, and that was the last time there was a live rescue. So uh, we spent 24 days um, basically on a, on, a massive, on a massive crime scene, which was um, a challenge in itself. So, so the team request, uh, so CDRP, we've, been, we've worked as part of the state um, response team for uh, about six years now, and, and going back farther than that, even if we talk about things that aren't drone or remote sensing related, um, all of our faculty are practitioners. Um, we maintain, uh, you know, keep our hand in the game, if you will. So we were requested by name uh, on Thursday night because of our capability um, and a lot of conversations that in planning that we've been doing with FEMA Region 4 uh, and the FEMA Urban Search and Rescue folks, as well as the state of Florida, on how we were gonna use imagery uh, and these new intelligence tools for hurricane season. So um, when the collapse happened, you know, the initial request was, um, let's see if FSU can come down and, and help us with that. And so we were happy to do that. Uh, we were originally tasked with supporting Florida Task Force One, which is um, one of the two uh, urban search and rescue task forces that's based in Miami. Florida Task Force One is owned by Miami-Dade Fire Rescue, um, as well as Florida Task Force Two, uh, which is the city of Miami. So both of those resources went to work uh, on this incident almost immediately um, because, you know, they're, they're right there. Um, in the 24, 25 operational days, we flew 314 sorties uh, and generated 1.1 terabytes uh, of data. We're going to give you some examples of what that looked like. There was, uh, we were by far not the only people flying drones. Um, I will say we're probably the only team that was doing uh, true remote sensing and GIS support. Um, but there were teams from fire rescue um, doing what we call overwatch. They're supporting the rescuers on the pile, uh, as well as firefighting operations when that was going on. Uh, from the law enforcement side, there was investigation happening. Um, and then as the event kind of evolved, uh, federal resources like NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology came in. Um, they investigate major structural events in much the same way that the NTSB investigates transportation accidents. So they were flying drones. Um, and then of course there was some public outreach and public information going on with, uh, with drones. But our, our focus was really on this mapping and modeling um, of the collapse site uh, to support the urban search and rescue operations, specifically the planning and the documentation of that. So the process that, um, that we established, and this is uh, part of this is something we've been doing for six or seven years uh, in a variety of contexts. And part of this is brand new. Um, and the real key to this is, is we were able to significantly compress the timeframe. Um, you're all familiar with using Google Maps 
uh, or Apple Maps or Google Earth or any of these tools uh, where you have a satellite view, right? So you can have it in the palm of your hand and you, you can see, um, you know, not just a map, but an actual satellite view of, of what you're looking at, the neighborhood or the business or whatever it is. Um, and that's become fairly common. Um, and you're probably also aware that sometimes that imagery is old. It might be six months old. It might be eight months old. It might be a year old. So in a disaster, the key, the, the, the kind of concept here is how do we provide that type of imagery um, in similar applications that instead of being weeks old or months old is only minutes old. Um, and that's for the first time what we were able to do at Surfside. And again, a lot of this came out of planning that we had been uh, you know, discussing for months. Uh, and this was just an unfortunate opportunity to, to put some of that to work. So we, we used the drone. Uh, we flew that at 250 feet. And this is an automated process. We, we program the flight. The drone takes off. It captures images um, for a two-dimensional map. It captured about 90 images for, per flight. For a three-dimensional model where it, it flew one track north-south and the other east-west, uh, we actually were, were pushing about 240 images uh, per flight. We would take those, the drone would land, we would take those images off the SD card, uh, process them on a laptop and software called uh, Agisoft Metashape Pro. Um, we eventually got that process down to about 30 minutes, um, sometimes as low as 20 or 25. Uh, we would export that in an open format called GeoTIFF, which is, um, uh, it's a, basically it creates a, a mosaic uh, of all those images kind of puzzled together. Um, and then we would use uh, some other software to push that up to the cloud, right? Everything, it's 2020, 2021 now, everything's got to go to the cloud, um, which is frustrating. And I'll, I'll get to that in, in a minute. Um, but so by pushing that up to FEMA's, they call it the, the USAR uh, Urban Search and Rescue application stack, uh, we'd be able to push that up there, and that would actually take about 20 minutes because these are large files that we have to have to upload. But the result is in about an hour, um, maybe an hour and 10 minutes from the time that that drone took off, uh, the planning team had an up-to-date map um, in all of their applications. And more importantly, the teams working on the collapse um, in all of their uh, uh, mobile applications uh, had the most recent map. Um, and that was valuable for, for a variety of reasons, uh, primarily as, as the event went forward, uh, it was from an investigative standpoint. So, uh, so the mapping process, we did that uh, several times a day. And this is an example of the ortho photo or, uh, that you would get from that. And this is, um, I actually don't know the exact date of this image, but it's prior to July 4th. Um, because you can see on the left-hand side there, the, there's the standing part uh, of the building, right? The, the, the alpha side on Collins Avenue, which is on the left side of the, uh, uh, of the image there, that was, uh, that was demolished uh, on July 4th. So they're able to get this type of imagery um, and it's accurate. Um, it was accurate to within a dozen centimeters or so at first. We got that better throughout the day or throughout the event. Um, and you could zoom in to and see objects that were um, three or four centimeters, a couple inches in size. Uh, and this was critical because as the teams are working, they're cataloging um, any finds that they, they have that are significant. Um, and GPS accuracy is very, very poor. So what they would have on their app is a, they would you know, mark a location and that pin would be accurate to within maybe 30 feet. Uh, but if they had accurate recent imagery, they could look around to significant things around them and then drag that pin on them on the application to a more appropriate location, to a more accurate location. So, um, so that was uh, that was pretty successful, um, all things considered. We also built uh, three dimensional models, um, and we didn't do this as often because it's time consuming, though we do have all the raw data. And currently uh, right here in the Bellamy building, um, it is, uh, we're grinding out um, higher resolution models um, as you go. And that can take 
dozens of hours uh, per run to, to get us a good model. But um, we created those uh, in Metashape Pro again, as well as in Esri's site scan product. Um, and that was more for on the in investigative and planning side um, than anything else. Um, all of that data has been turned over now to uh, Miami-Dade Police Department, who is the agency with jurisdiction, uh, as well as NIST, um, and it will support their, uh, their structural investigation uh, as they go forward. So timing-wise, uh, when we first got there on the 25th, we were doing this every two hours during daylight. Um, that was unsustainable, so we went to uh, every three hours. Um, and then after the 4th of July, when uh, after the demolition uh, of the of the standing part of the structure, uh, we cut that down to four captures per day. Um, and then so we built those maps four times a day. Uh, we built one 3D model a day and then we provided um, whatever imagery uh, or video the, the planning team needed. So that's one side. Um, and, you know, Surfside, it really, from a wider aspect besides drones, really illustrated a lot of concerns that we have um, in, when it talks about major disasters. And right, so right now, this is a satellite image of Ida um, right before it made landfall um, on 30 August. So Surfside was 2.1 acres in size. Um, and so, so 2.1 acres is a small site. It's one, you know, one city block, uh, and it consumed a lot of resources, not only at the state level but nationally. And if we get a major Cat Five hurricane, or we get a major seismic event in Southern California, or in the Pacific Northwest, or in Tennessee, um, we're going to create that type of damage um, on a much wider scale. And so being able to perform these missions quickly and economically is going to be even more and more important. So we've already kicked off conversations uh, with FEMA on the, on the urban search and rescue side uh, about how do we expand this? How do we, um, and that's not just Florida State, but how do we teach other people to do this um, so that we can have that capacity on a national level, uh, not just here in the state? So let's talk about, shift gears a little bit here and talk about Ida pretty fast. So um, we were requested again by name by the Louisiana State Fire Marshal's Office, but that was really in, in response to the FEMA incident support team. And this was all came directly because, um, uh, this all came about because of Surfside. This was the same incident support team that was running um, Ida for on, for on the FEMA side that was uh, deployed to Surfside for that event. So uh, again, they wanted to see that same type of mapping and modeling as quickly as possible on a wider area. Uh, for the first time, and this was, uh, it's, it seems minor, but it's, uh, it's important. This was an EMAC request, uh, Emergency Management Assistance Compact. So the state of Louisiana requested the state of Florida to send us um, and, you know, that was gratifying because we've been working on trying to get that uh, functional for three or four years now. So, um, so the really, we spent, uh, we only spent three days. Uh, the USAR side of things uh, was relatively low key. The urban search and rescue side was um, mostly unnecessary, right? We, the state of Louisiana staged a lot of resources in anticipation that uh, Ida could be as bad as Katrina. Um, however, that did not play out in the more urban areas, right? Louisiana, uh, or I'm sorry, New Orleans was spared the majority of the flooding, et cetera, that was seen in 2005 uh, because of better mitigation. They, uh, you know, they built back stronger than they did uh, before. However, areas south of, uh, of New Orleans, which are significant and extremely rural uh, and difficult to navigate and did take significant damage. So on Tuesday, the 31st of August, uh, our team was airlifted onto Grand Isle, um, which is uh, you know, a barrier island, um, fishing community, vacation community. Uh, we were airlifted as part of the Urban Search and Rescue's uh, Rapid Needs Assessment Team. Uh, so there was nine personnel, three, of, three from our team, uh, three from Texas Task Force One, and three from Maryland Task Force One. Um, and the job was to assess the conditions on the ground in Grand Isle and, and help decide what resources need to be put to work uh, quickly. We only had four hours uh, on the ground. Um, you know, there's, uh, if you think that uh, 
trying to be on time to make a Delta flight is important. Um, I do highly recommend you don't miss the National Guard helicopter uh, that's going to take you back to the mainland, because uh, if you miss it, you're stuck. Um, so we only had four hours. That was, uh, that was it. Uh, and the goal was to assess damage as well as look at transportation, uh, infrastructure, whatever the community needs were, and more importantly, assess the condition of the bridge and causeways. Um, so could, you know, what needs to be done to get ground resources uh, onto the island. So in that four hours, we managed to cover um, about four and a half to five miles uh, of the island um, with, by mapping. Uh, and we also shot about 90 minutes of um, uh, video imagery. So, you know, this is a sample of the type of uh, information you can gain here. You can definitely see uh, structural damage, but more importantly, we can pinpoint flooding uh, where that is still standing water, um, which was significant in, in many places of Grand Isle. Uh, many of the roads were impassable still, um, as well as you can see here, uh, Grand Isle has a, um, a levee or a uh, seawall, if you will, on the ocean side. So the uh, the, the Gulf of Mexico is to the left of this photo. And in many places that, that levee was washed out and damaged. And actually most of the sand that was deposited on the roads and uh, in houses probably came from uh, the levee itself. So, and you can also see in this image, there's significant flooding. Uh, more importantly from the raw imagery though, we can take this and compare it to maps in the FEMA applications and start to flag where we're seeing significant damage. It's not we can't, in the time we had, we couldn't cover the entire island, but we can start to get percentages. We can start to say, hey, of the area that we've covered, um, you know, in this sample area, we were able to see that, um, you know, 45% of the houses have significant roof damage and 20% are off their foundations. So uh, in a relatively short period of time, we can start to gather some significant information about, uh, about what's happening. Um, so between these two events and most of the events that I've worked, drone or not, over my career, uh, issues and challenges, um, work, work pace and fatigue uh, is, is an issue. Um, Surfside in particular wore everybody down. It was a long event. Um, it started to feel very much like Groundhog Day. Um, you know, Tuesday felt like Monday, felt like Sunday. It was all pretty much the same. And, and when you get tired like that, you're more likely to make mistakes. Um, so that's always a, an issue there. Communication and coordination. Um, we can't do this work uh, by ourselves. So we've got to be able to um, coordinate with other resources, whether that be the USAR teams, uh, emergency management. Um, for Surfside, we needed a lot of support from Miami-Dade County, particularly their GIS and, and civil engineers uh, to place um, uh, ground, uh, ground control points. Uh, so that we can improve the accuracy of our 3D maps and everything else. And actually, the photo here is one of the, the GCPs, the ground control points that they placed for us. Uh, and those are survey points, right? So those are um, highly accurate as far as where they are exactly. And, and by seeing those in the imagery, we can then tie that back to um, where it is in the real world and, and make everything more accurate. So um, but that took, a, that took time. That took um, days in a lot of ways to get that, that coordination done. Communication is always a challenge. Um, on Grand Isle, radios, um, uh, all we could talk to were our resources that were a mile, a mile and a half away. We had all kinds of problems uh, talking to other people, um, which is always a challenge. Uh, we worked Michael uh, in the same issue on Mexico Beach. Uh, we had no communications out there whatsoever. Uh, data management is a challenge. I mentioned for Surfside, it was 1.1 terabytes of data. That's by far the biggest we've ever done. However, even Grand Isle uh, and the three days of reconnaissance we did there uh, in Louisiana um, was, uh, was over 100 gigabytes uh, of imagery again. And so moving that around is a challenge. Um, even physically copying it to thumb drives and things like that can take a while. Um, Non-compliant aircraft uh, in a disaster environment, um, there's all kinds of helicopters and fixed wing aircraft operating. Uh, you can communicate with them sometimes and sometimes you can't. Um, and so that makes it a, it's a challenge, right? It's a, it's a very, very busy airspace. Weather, it's always too hot or too sunny or too rainy. Uh, one of those three things. Um, I've, I've never had the opportunity to work someplace where it's too cold. Now that I've said that out loud, I'll probably freeze. Uh, the next place that we go. But um, workspace, 
you know, working out of the back of a vehicle is a challenge. And then upstream bandwidth, it's um, everything, I mentioned this before, everything we're doing now with, with FEMA uh, in the state of Florida requires us to upload this data to, to the cloud. Um, that's a challenge when nothing's working. And uh, even during Surfside, which happened, you know, in the middle of Miami, uh, you know, in the middle of Miami-Dade County, uh, we, um, we were having to move around quite a bit just to try to find uh, upstream bandwidth to keep that process moving quickly. And of course, the irony is we're moving that up, up to the cloud when the person that's going to make use of this information is, you know, 50 yards away. Um, but that's one of the many things that we're going to try to work on. Uh, how do we cut the internet out of that work process um, and still be able to do the same thing that we were before? Successes are numerous, right? Uh, first and foremost, we were in all these events, we were able to create actionable, usable information that drove decisions. Um, on Grand Isle in particular, by the time we got back to Baton Rouge and delivered all that information, um, they rewrote the plan for the next operational period. Um, and, you know, re redirected resources that were going to go elsewhere to put them on the Grand Isle because they didn't realize how bad it was when that day started. Um, and so, you know, just by being able to do this quickly, um, we're able to, to, to kind of change the way the response went, right? Um, FSU, we've, we've developed new workflows and procedures. Uh, as far as how to create that information quickly, how to get it into the hands of people, um, you know, who who need it in a very short period of time is uh, is is key to us. Um, and you know, maybe more importantly, we've laid the foundation for ongoing um, and future research and development. So, so next step, some of the things that we're that we're working on uh, here in FEMA Region Four, which is the southeastern United States. Uh, we've made great progress on streamlining the way we do collection planning. How do we decide what's important? How do we assign appropriate resources, right? Um, you know, the, the two case studies we talked to are, are heavy on drones, but that is definitely not uh, the only piece of this puzzle, right? Um, you also note nowhere in here did I talk about how cool the drones were or what we flew or anything else, because that's really not the piece that's of interest to to me or to our team or to our partners um you know so it, between the state and the federal partners in, in an event here in florida uh you know we have a good game plan every day about what is what's our priorities what's going to get covered how are we going to do that and we mix together satellite imagery we mixed manned aircraft imagery and we mixed unmanned um and we're quite proud to have helped mold that process um, because it's now being duplicated across other uh, nine FEMA regions, right? So um, the man collection integration, how do we use the right tool for the right job? The right tool is not always a drone. A drone is, um, it's highly agile, um, not necessarily because it's, it's maneuverable, but because we can, we can task it quickly. Um, that's great. And usually that can be done, you know, on the ground. But there's other tools out there that do things we can't do. You know, the image we're looking at right here is an example of what we call SAR or synthetic aperture radar. Uh, that can see through clouds, that can operate at night, uh, has a lot of things that drones or color cameras can't do. Um, the problem is you get this kind of image. You don't get a color image, you get a kind of a three-dimensional map of the ground, which is great if you need to assess how many structures are up and how many structures are down. Um, but there's, it, it can't do everything either, right? And it's also very good at determining the extent of floodwaters. But, um, you know, there's some things it's good at and some things it's not. So it's all about figuring out the right tool uh, for the right time. Um, at the same time, the, the private sector is doing a lot of this work as well, right? The insurance companies and the consortiums that support the insurance companies with imagery are just as interested as emergency managers are in the conditions on the ground, right? Um, and we started to see as, as, as early as 2018, with some of these companies who were able to use drone imagery and manned aircraft imagery to start um, the, uh, the insurance process for policyholders, uh, even while they're still evacuated. And that, uh, and that can really cut down the time before these families uh, see some relief from their insurance companies. And so that's a, that's a critical piece. So how do we, how do we, partner with these private sectors uh, entities so that we're not, so we're sharing information. We're not duplicating effort again 
Uh, and you know, we're making some progress there. Uh, and finally, we're trying to put everything on one map, right? FEMA has a, a phrase they use all the time, one map, one fight. Um, it's cute. Um, it's not necessarily true right now. That's, a, that's the big problem. Uh, you know, you say FEMA and everybody assumes it's this big monolithic agency and that's not true. It's, it's 10 regions and headquarters and different offices and, you know, different people have different ideas and the right hand doesn't necessarily know that the left hand exists, much less what it's doing. Um, so it's a challenge at times. Um, so we're trying to build that common operating picture. And how do we put um, USAR rapid needs assessment data together with more traditional reconnaissance together with damage assessment and put it all on a single pane of glass, a single digital map um, that we can use that and include things that uh, we've also been working on here at FSU, um, such as open source intelligence or social media um, and things like that. And because you know, very often the public is gonna tell us what's happening um, in a disaster before anybody from anywhere gets there, right? Uh, you're gonna post a video uh, or a picture to Snapchat and you know that uh, that chant that we shouldn't discount that. Um, so how do we put all that together? That's something we're working on right now. And finally, we're you know we're helping to create new technology. We just got a National Science Foundation grant um, to use the data from Surfside to help build better robots. Um, you know that was a we threw a lot of technology at the Surfside problem. Uh, some of it worked and some of it didn't. Um, Surfside was also unique in the, in the type of collapse that it was. Um, some of the more traditional types of robots may not have worked. So we're partnered with Texas A&M University and Carnegie Mellon University to, um, to really help decide what should robots that do wide area search and structural collapse look like? You know, how do we get beyond um, you know, the tracked robots or the snake robots or the flying drones? And, and what's the, uh, what, what would be appropriate and once we've got that defined, then maybe we can, well, not me, because I'm not an engineer, but, uh, but uh, someone can go forth and, and build that better mousetrap. All right, I'm going to stop my screen share here. Um, I think I hit my time mark pretty well. Yes, great. Thanks so much, Dr. Merrick. The work that you're doing is so important. I hadn't heard about the grant, so congratulations. I look forward to hearing about that, about robots. It just, it's mind blowing in a lot of ways, um, how cutting edge, uh, how cutting edge we are. I know, so folks, just as a reminder, if you would like, you can type in a question in the Q&A. I see um, you, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, you will see a little Q&A box or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you and so that you can ask a question. So raising your hand is, You'll see Q&A, chat, share screen, and raise your hand along the bottom. Um, I did, I actually wanted to ask you a quick question, mostly a, a bragging point. Uh, the program involves so many students. What are some of the different ways that FSU students are involved in this work? So that's, uh, that's a great, uh, great question. So we have, we have academic courses on UAS and emergency management, and that's, um, and we, so we see undergrads and grads come through there. Um, however, you know, on both of these events, we had PhD students working with us, right? So uh, Austin Bush, who's a PhD student in geography, um, deployed to both events. Um, and, you know, he, he's, he's a wizard when it comes to working some of the software. So, uh, you know, give props where it's due. He's, uh, he's done a lot for us on, the, on that whole workflow side of things. Uh, we also have, um, Laura Hart, who's a PhD student here in the ASCII school, um, and she worked at Surfside, and well, she's actually deployed for a lot of us, a lot of things over the years, but uh, uh, it is, it's, uh, it's great that we can get students involved um, in little ways and big ways, uh, and more importantly, you know, I love the fact that we go out and do these events, and um, we learn, right, so the faculty, the faculty learns about, you know, how things are being done, and that has value in the classroom, right? So when we come back in, we can uh, we we bring the the latest information, if you will, into there. And great. So Chris asks, what drone worked best at Surfside? And I don't know if you can give us just like a little bit of overview of drones. I'm not 
Great. I don't know a lot about drones, so. Sure. So uh, Surfside, we flew one drone pretty exclusively, and that was the DJI Mavic 2 Pro. Um, we have a lot of, a lot of tools in the toolbox. Uh, but for what we were being asked to do uh, and create those maps on a regular basis, we picked one airframe uh, and just used that. The, the goal was to have as a repeatable a process as possible. So we have a lot of data and it's as similar as it possibly can be, right? So the Mavic 2, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's a typical little quadcopter. Um, they're not, it's an off the shelf solution, right? You can go buy one, um, at Best Buy or Amazon for, you know, 1800 or a couple thousand dollars. It's not, uh, um, but it's a workhorse. It really is. So. Huh. Right, great. So Megan asks if there's ever an issue with own ownership of images as you capture them. In fact, I noticed one of the, uh, one of your slides said not for public release. So, and she's wondering, is it different for something like Ida versus something like Surfside, which it might be considered a crime scene. Sure. So Surfside was unique because it was a crime scene. Uh, and, you know, Miami-Dade uh, PD homicide was, was the agency that was responsible for all the data. So, um, you know, I can show the image. Um, I can't give it to you because everything that we took at Surfside um, has been handed over to the agency having jurisdiction, which is Miami-Dade PD. Um, and, you know, we, we've been asked not to, not to share that from any of that data imagery yet. Uh, and so that's fine. Um, we're happy to, to comply with that. Other places, it varies by jurisdiction, um, who is, you know, who the requesting agency, a variety of things like that. So Louisiana, I mean, we always turn all the data over to whomever is requesting it, um, you know, Louisiana didn't have any issue with us using Ida imagery. Um, I, I guess prior to Surfside, the most restrictive thing I've seen was um, we sent a team as part of an academic consortium to uh, Hawaii in 2018 for the volcanic eruption out there. Um, and the Hawaii County, which is the big island in Hawaii County Civil Defense, were adamant that no imagery could be released. We couldn't post anything on social media or anything else. So um, it just varies. Um, but, you know, as part of the response, we try to, uh, we honor the wishes of whomever's running things is what it boils down to. Okay, well, and before we were talking, before we started just a bit about um, some of the privacy issues, how does that fit in? So there's ownership issues, but how does that fit with something and like Surfside or you have to be extra careful about what you're showing because you might show someone's belongings. I have no idea what even issues would be at play in that regard. There's a lot. Um, there's a lot of pieces. And actually, that's one of the reasons that uh, that FEMA and the federal government, you know, FEMA being a, a, a division of the Department of Homeland Security, is very leery about having their own aircraft and capturing data because they have very tight constraints on PII or personally identifiable information. They can't store it. They can't create it, anything like that. So, you know, if they have a photo of a person's face um, or a license plate or things like that, that's a problem for them uh, at the federal level. So, and then of course, anything we do that interfaces with them, you know, we have to make sure that we're in line with what they're doing. So, um, back in, uh, 2017, um, when we were, we worked Hurricane Harvey and we actually got a NSF grant after Harvey primarily to create a publicly releasable data set from all that imagery. So we had to go through all the images, all the video and scrub anything that was identifiable. Um, so addresses license plate, not that we get a lot of that, but it, you still got to check it all. Um, and then we made that available to NSF so that they could make it available to other researchers. So, um, so there's that issue. And then from state to state, there's, there's a variety of issues. Here in Florida, we have very tightly controlled UAS use on privacy. Um, uh, again, in 2017, we worked Hurricane Irma and we could do damage assessment for county owned property. We were in Collier County. So we could take images of things that the county owned, but then when they were looking to do damage assessment of in Immokalee and places like that, we can't take images of private property that we can't see from the road. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of restrictions and, and 
protections in there, honestly, to keep uh, to keep government from, you know, playing Big Brother, I guess. So Laura asks, how heavily does the UAS team work with GIS when responding to different types of events such as Surfside or Hurricane Ida? So the the the, the secret that I don't like to say out loud is that. UAS is GIS, right? Because as soon as we, if we're going to make this useful, if we're going to integrate this with decision makers, that is 100% got to be in the GIS realm, right? So, um, because for the for the most part, uh, I, if I give you just, a, if I shoot some video and give it to you, um, it's not going to have a lot of value because where was that? right where where was that geospatially located what is that showing me what is that telling me uh and that's where the gis side comes in so everything we do is to be really useful it's got to be processed uh, and really needs to be a pin on the map uh somewhere so that's why that goal is that single map with all the different types of of imagery and whatnot uh in there so chris wonders and this is a great question i'm curious about this as well how do you keep all the entities drones safe from air collisions do you have an air boss or time slots for each agency, altitude assignments? How does all that of work? Above. Yeah, okay. so um, it varies by event. So first of all, you know, Surfside was unique for us because uh, one of the many hats I wear with the, with the state is in air operations. Uh, and I often find myself in that role of, I don't get to fly, I'm gonna be the one that coordinates who does what, manned and unmanned. Uh, Surfside, we didn't have that problem. Um, there was a temporary flight restriction put in place. So the FAA restricted all flights, manned and unmanned, in a mile radius around the collapse site. So the only people operating legally, and there were some illegal operators, the only people operating legally were the response partners. We all knew each other really much by the... Most of us knew each other before we started. Um, and really by a day into the event, we all knew each other. And then we used a super high-tech way to coordinate all of that and that was a whatsapp group um so we uh we all got in a whatsapp and every time somebody would launch we would say announce where we were going at what altitude uh and then we would announce when we're done so that gave us a, a running dialogue of of who's doing what and it was remarkably effective we didn't have really any issues at all um you get into an event like uh, michael on mexico beach or I didn't have any gray hair before Grand Isle. That's that's the joke. Um, there were helicopters everywhere, and you know it's our job on the unmanned side to be the ones that see and avoid. Um, so it can be a challenge. In the state of Florida, we we use airspace allocation or, or airspace layering, if you will. We have an airspace management plan that defines surface to 200 feet um, will be for unmanned aircraft. Um, you'll see helicopters sometimes surface to 500 for in certain areas. So it varies from event to event, but you've got to put time and effort into that. Um, otherwise it's a it's an incident waiting to happen. Very interesting. So uh, uh, if you have a question or comment, you can also raise your hand, put it in the Q&A or the chat or raise your hand while you're deciding about your question. Let me just tell you about our next events that are upcoming. So you should be able to see my screen. So what we have, just if you wanna follow or learn more about policy pubs and other research and students and graduate students, uh, please come to our, what, our Wicked, so what, Wicked Problem, Wicked Solution blog, where you can learn about all sorts of very interesting things happening at the college. You can follow us on on Twitter, or you can follow us at Facebook at FSU Costs. We are also on Instagram at FSU Costs. And if you want to catch a pub that you missed or any other of the college events, there is a YouTube channel that you can follow as well. We do have two more pubinars this semester, and the next one will be October 12th at 5.30, titled Equal Opportunity discrimination in the workplace and marketplace, which will feature one of our assistant professors in economics, Dr. Mackenzie Alston. So let me quit sharing that and see if there are any more questions or comments. I am not seeing any. So let me just say thank you so much for the work that you're doing and thanks for taking time 
to, to share your experiences with us and frankly educate all of us a bit more about this important work that you're doing and, and disaster decision making, which unfortunately we, we seem to be making a lot of lately. We do, but I appreciate the time. Yes, thank you. And good night, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us this evening. Night. Night, everybody.